today on Path of Grace. I wonder if the truth is simply this. Contentment has nothing to do with how much we have of anything. I think about King Solomon. King Solomon was the richest dude who ever lived. Read through the book of Ecclesiastes, and he sums it up by saying it is all vanity. You look at Solomon, and he had all the money you could possibly have, and he wasn't satisfied. Solomon tried to find satisfaction and contentment in building projects. It didn't satisfy. He thought he'd be more content through partying, but it didn't satisfy. And boy, did he party. And he said, it's all vanity. In other words, he was saying, all those things that I tried to find contentment in left me all the more discontent because contentment isn't based upon things. It's interesting if we take a look at the people around us and we spend some time with people who already have what we think we need in order to be content and satisfied, what we will probably discover is that they aren't content. Hey there, my friend. This is James Flanders. Thank you so much for stopping in to visit with me. You know, something that's important for you to know is that when I record these audios, it's not about preaching at you or anyone else. It's primarily preaching at myself and you're invited along for the ride and the truth is we're both on this journey together as we are learning to walk the path of grace as we're learning more and more about the Lord and and walking with God and the greatness of who Christ is and what Father has done for us through his only begotten son Jesus Christ and we're learning lessons from the lives of people we read about in Scripture And one lesson that I have struggled with my whole life, and it's been a real struggle lately, is in the area of contentment. And so today, I am going to preach to myself about this, remind myself about the importance of contentment. In this passage, Paul is writing to the Philippians from prison, where he had been suffering greatly as a result of serving the Lord and sharing the gospel. And from that prison, he said this, I have learned in whatever state I am in, to be content. Paul talks about having times where he had a lot financially, an abundance, and then times when he had nothing. And he goes on and he says this, with food and clothing, we should be content. Now, I don't know about you, especially with the family. I struggle with having that sort of contentment. Come on, Paul. Can't we add a few more things to the list? Food, clothing, a house, air conditioning, a car. And I think If Paul were alive today, living in our culture, he would probably say, yeah, you do need a little bit more than food and clothing. After all, in our culture, you can't even hold a job uh, without a car in many cases or some sort of, of transportation. But Paul's point is really that we should learn to be content with the bare necessities for life and not to be stressed out over the other stuff. With food and clothing, we should be Content. Again, I struggle with that. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because throughout my life I've been indoctrinated with the lies the world has told me about what I need to have in order to be happy and content. Maybe it's because around the clock we are bombarded with so much that is designed specifically to make us discontent with what we have so that we'll buy something else. Magazines, newspapers, TV, the internet radio, billboards, Facebook, it all contains advertising. In fact, those things all exist for the purpose of putting advertising in front of us. And that advertising is designed to stir up discontentment with what we have and to make us hunger and lust for what we don't have. And the people doing the advertising don't make money unless they actually sell me and you the products. And they aren't going to sell you what you don't have unless they bring you to the point of dissatisfaction with what you do have. And unfortunately, for me, and maybe for you, it quite often works. All of us have experienced it in one way or another. I know people who it's about cars. Every couple years they get a car. They succumb to what they read and what they see. You just got a new car a few years back, and man, you loved it. You were perfectly content with a 2008, right? It ran great. It got you where you wanted to go. But then the 2012 came out, and you saw the ads, you saw the articles, you couldn't get it out of your mind. See, the 2012, it had a curve in the dash where yours was square, and the curve, oh, it's so beautiful. And the square, it's just a square. And before you knew it, 
you weren't even thinking about the fact that your current car was paid off and insurance rates were lower. You weren't thinking about the fact that you could probably get at least another 100,000 miles out of that thing. The fact that it was getting you from point A to point B very effectively wasn't even the issue anymore. What you needed in a vehicle no longer mattered because the issue has now become that sexy curve in the dash. And your car doesn't have the curve, and so you trade it in. You upgrade for what? For the curve. And now, again, is happiness. The car is running great. It's getting it from point A to point B, just like the one with the square dash was doing. But this car is not paid off. Now you're in debt again, but somehow it seems okay because you've got the sexy curve in the dash. Then before you know it, oh, no, out come the ads for the 2013. Now you smile when you see the picture of the interior because the dash hasn't changed one bit. It's the same curve that you've got, and you're like, oh, yeah, I've got the curve. But then you flip the page and you see a picture of the amazing new rear fenders on the 2013. Oh, what a sexy rear end on that car. It has a flare where my 2008 is just straight. In fact, you hadn't even noticed it before, but your older car, which is just a couple years old, is kind of boxy looking. It's nowhere near as sharp as the 2013. And now all you can think about is the sexy flared fenders on the rear end. And now the dash doesn't even matter. And once more... You're discontent. Doesn't matter. You could get another 150 or 200,000 miles out of this car that is getting you from point A to point B just fine, which is what a car is supposed to do. Oh, man, the fenders, they're just boxy and not, not curved. Now, I know that's kind of a goofy, silly example, but it makes a point. And at least to some degree, it is true. For a lot of people, it's not an issue of automobiles. Maybe for some, it's clothing. You've got plenty of clothing. It all does the job just fine. But that other outfit that you saw in that commercial in that or on that magazine, it's just so much better. The colors are so new. Now what you've got just doesn't cut it. The people selling the new clothing are telling you that yours isn't cool. It's not in. It's old school. And we've got to have the new. Why? Because the people selling the new tell me that's what I've got to have in order to be an attractive, worthwhile human being. For others, it's not cars or clothing, it's gadgets and gizmos, and I've struggled with this in my life. For some, it's computers. Oh, man, if I could get that new one, oh, the things I could do, the power that would be at my disposal, and you get it, and suddenly you're state-of-the-art, you have the power, you're so happy, until you get the next issue of Computing Magazine, and you find out about the latest, greatest processor. It doesn't matter that you've still never used your current computer to its fullest potential. It doesn't matter that it's actually getting the job done. The fact that you know that there's something newer or faster, it's got a hold of your mind, and the articles that you've read, articles that have been funded by the advertisers and the magazines that you subscribe to, tell you that you really, really need the new one, and so now you're just not happy at all. You can't even sleep because your computer just isn't fast enough. Let me tell you, I was stuck in that trap for a long, long time. And you know what? Right now I'm recording this audio on a computer that's about six years old, and it is working great. You know what I did about six years ago? I quit reading the computer magazines. For some people, it's not material things. It's power. It's prestige. It's position. For others, it's just money for the sake of money. Even though they have nothing they actually want to spend it on, no matter how big the bank account is, it's never enough. Always need a little bit more. If I could get a wee bit more, then I would be content. How much is enough? One million more. Hmm. I wonder if the truth is simply this. Contentment has nothing to do with how much we have of anything. I think about King Solomon. King Solomon was the richest dude who ever lived. Read through the book of Ecclesiastes, and he sums it up by saying it is all vanity. You look at Solomon, and he had all the money you could possibly have, and he wasn't satisfied. Solomon tried to find satisfaction and contentment in building projects. It didn't satisfy. He thought he'd be more content through partying, but it didn't satisfy. And boy, did he party. And he said, it's all vanity. In other words, he was saying, all those things that I tried to find contentment in left me all the more discontent because contentment isn't based upon things. It's interesting if we take a look at the people around us and we spend some time with people who already have what we think we need in order to be content and satisfied, what we will probably discover is that they aren't content. So many people who have what we think will make us happy, they're still striving, pushing, trying to attain more, but they can't get enough to find contentment. Oh, man. Sometimes I'm terrible at contentment. There have been times in my life where I've been discontent over French fries. 
There's been times I've gone out to eat with a friend. We order the classic American meal, a burger, fries, and a Coke. I get my food. I'm happy as I start to eat my burger. Then I look down and notice that they gave my buddy more fries than they gave me. And all of a sudden, I'm not content with what's on my plate. Has that ever happened to you? How come you got more fries than me? I want more fries, man. See, in that instance, the problem starts when I take my eyes off my plate and start looking at someone else's plate. And sometimes in life for us, it's not a plate. Maybe it's a house, a car, a boat, a job, whatever. Maybe it's just a thought of a bigger bank account. And that brings another passage to my mind. It's uh, in First Timothy. Uh, Paul is writing to Timothy about people who teach that following the Lord is a means of financial gain. The money message that you might hear uh, sometimes on TV. And what they teach is oftentimes intended to bring discontentment and cause people to focus more on money and temporal things by actually giving money to them. Anyway, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want to read to you what Paul says starting in verse 1. Uh, he's talking about working hard for our employers, serving our masters. Uh, he talks about bond servants, which are willing slaves, which that's what a person is. If you go to work for a company, you're a bond servant. You're willingly offering your service to them. And Paul says this, Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. And he says, teach and exhort these things. And then in verse 3, he says this, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. Then in verse 6, he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. Walking with God, trusting in the Lord, serving the Lord, not serving self, and having contentment. That is great gain. Paul learned to be content, and he says godliness with contentment is great gain gain. And then in verse 7, holy smoke, he puts everything into perspective. He says, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. In other words, you never ever see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. If you did, it would be weird, wouldn't it? And then a verse that I quoted at the beginning, uh, he said, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Kind of puts things into perspective. And there's a lot of people who have a whole lot less than I do and less than you do. I heard, oh, a few years ago, and I'm probably off by a few percentage points, but that if we have any spare change lying around at home in a drawer, money that we don't have to have in order to survive for the week, that we are in the top 15% of the wealthiest people on this planet. Just because we have some spare change lying around. We're some of the wealthiest people on the planet. Next time you go to a class reunion, you can brag about that. Say, yeah, I'm in the top 15% of the wealthiest people on planet Earth. But so is everyone else who has any change lying around their house. So often we get upset. We lose sleep over what we don't have rather than giving thanks for what we do have. Oh, Father, I'm so thankful for what I have. Sometimes we don't spend time enjoying what we've been blessed with because we can't stop working and striving to try and get what we don't have because someone told us that what we don't have is what's going to make us happy and make us content if we can just get our hands on it. But more and more I'm convinced that stuff is less than worthless. Don't get me wrong, there is stuff I like. I really like guitars a lot. Guitars are actually a tool I use to make a little bit of extra money to keep food on the table. But there are so many things worth so much more than cars and clothes and guitars and trinkets. There's, what, six or seven billion things on this planet worth much more. It's people. And as we look at people, as we get to know people, as we build relationships with people, as we learn to love people, which is what Jesus teaches us it's all about, that's what really a 
a right life is all about. It's what we're called to, is to, to love one another, which is a tough job, isn't it? But as we commit to loving one another, it causes us to begin to see things differently. It's interesting how so many things are relative. You look at someone with more than you, you see the french fries on their plate, and you grow discontent. On the other hand, if you and if I spend time with people who have much less than we do, it does something else. It's humbling. It's sobering. It's convicting in a very good way. You know, in the past, I've spent time uh, in a very impoverished part of Mexico. Uh, several years I went down there for a couple weeks at a time, helping build houses for people who had nothing, uh, visiting an agricultural work camp where people are pretty much doing slave labor, seeing the things that people live in, seeing where they go to the bathroom, staring into the eyes of, of little kids as they would stand in line, and we would give them a little scoop of rice, a scoop of beans, and a couple of tiny tortillas, and they were acting like it was Christmas morning. That's a contentment readjuster, which I needed today, which is probably why Father brought some of those memories back to me. But the truth is, we don't even have to go to Mexico to get that contentment readjuster. How about if we go visit someone in the hospital, spend time in a nursing home, pour a bit of what we've got into the life of someone else, and do unto them what you would want done unto you if the roles were reversed, which is really, in my eyes, what a Jesus-y life is wrapped up in. And then Paul goes on in verse 9. He says, but those who desire to be rich, in other words, those who aren't content but always want more, 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 and it's never enough, he says they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And then a very famous verse, which is always misquoted, or typically misquoted. He says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I want you to note, it does not say that money is a root of all evil. It says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not evil. Having money is not evil. It says that loving money leads to all sorts of evil. And here's the mysterious kicker about it. You don't even have to have a dime to be a lover of money. You can be loving it and living for it without actually having any of it. Verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That's how it's worded in the New King James here, which I'm using to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Hmm. I look at this and I wonder how many parents have missed out on their kids growing up because they just don't spend time with them because no matter how much we have, we seem to think we need a little bit more, a little bigger, a little better. Just work a few more hours each day. And once we get this and once we get that, then I'll spend some time with the kids. But in the end... The years pass, and it goes from needing this thing and that thing to those things over there. And before long, the kids are grown, and the parents don't even know them. I think we could say that's evil. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Mom, Dad, if you're listening, your kids are not going to remember how fancy the car is. What they will remember is what happened in the car, whether relationships were built in the car, whether conversations that meant something took place in the car. Our kids aren't going to remember how big, nice, and plush the house is. They're going to remember whether or not we were ever actually home to spend time with them in that house. My name is James Flanders, and just like you, I'm learning to be content. And by the grace of God, You and I do have a bit more than just food and clothing. Aren't you glad? Be blessed, my friend. Be blessed.